And so I think if we really want to understand my values and who I am and uh, is really to understand where I came from. So um, my story really starts here, which is the house I grew up in, uh, in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, my parents built this by hand, by themselves, largely, uh, on the side of a mountain in Asheville. Uh, we have beautiful views, surrounding mountains, the Blue Ridge Parkway, kind of across the valley. Um, it was it was really a kind of a magical place to grow up. On a, on a daily basis, I would I would take my dog out and explore the the hillsides for for hours at a time. Um, and so, uh, my parents obviously impacted me quite a bit. They're they're actually both here today. My mom Renee. Uh, on the left, I guess I'm probably in her belly right there, actually, uh, now that I think about it. Um, and, uh, and my dad, Jacob, and then in the center, my sister, uh, Nicole, and I, um, rocking the 1980s era uh, socks. So uh, I have that going for me. So uh, my, my parents actually divorced when I, was, when I was 12 years old. I think, you know, there were, there were too many things that they, they didn't share for their marriage to work. But there were two important things that they did share. So one is that they loved and supported me and my sister. And two, they shared in us a key value of helping others. And so uh, a thousand miles apart and, and years before they even met, my parents were summer camp counselors. My mom with underprivileged children in Indiana, my dad with a wide range of kids, including those with emotional and behavioral challenges in Pennsylvania. And I think these experiences for them were the first steps down a road that they, they both shared, which is a calling as a teacher. So my parents though, were not just any teachers, they were special ed teachers. And their whole careers, they helped behaviorally, emotionally, physically challenged kids to live their best lives. And I believe you don't become a teacher and especially a special ed teacher, unless you firmly believe in the inherent worth and dignity of everyone. But even more so, I think they recognize a fundamental truth, which is that we are all connected here on this third rock from the sun. I think teachers, especially in North Carolina, don't get paid enough to do what they do unless they truly believe that investing in children is the right thing to do, not only for the child, but for the community at large. So the goodness of all is dependent on the goodness of those who need it the most, and that we are not just individuals, here on this earth, but we are interdependent on each other and we ignore that at our own peril. And I, I, I've often thought about what would happen if my parents and other teachers, I think Vishali, you were a teacher at, at a point, um, didn't heed their calling to help the, the 7 million kids who need these services in our schools every year. I mean, these kids wouldn't just disappear, right? That's what I mean by interdependence. We can't just stick our head in the sand and hope the needs of these kids or the needs of anyone else in our society that have needs gets magically resolved. So growing up with parents that were helpers led me to try to seek my own way to help. So at UNC in undergrad, I majored in political science because I thought that was the way I could help serve my community in government. And so I did internships in local government at Wake County and in federal government. And I realized that how I could help might be a little bit more nuanced. So I spread my wings a little bit. I tried working in other areas, sports business consulting, uh, tried real estate services, but it didn't ever really quite fit with who I really was. And it wasn't until the summer between my first and second year of business school, when I interned at a local transportation company software company called Transloc that helped NC State students see when their bus was coming, that I started to see how I could apply that helpfulness I learned from my parents in a different way. So prior to that internship in the summer of 2006, I actually didn't have that much experience with public transit living where we did on the side of a mountain in Asheville. Really the only experience I did have was actually a somewhat traumatic one. My dad was attending an educational conference in San Francisco and I probably about 12 or so, and he allowed me to come with him. And that was an amazing experience to, to be able to, to do. And so we arrived late into San Francisco, it was in the evening, and we took a bus from the airport. And this is, those of you who've gone to San Francisco, there's now a rail extension to the airport. This was not there then. So we took a bus and we got downtown to our stop and I got off the bus. And as I descended into the big city, the unfamiliar streets of the big city, 
I turned around and I saw the bus pulling away with my dad still on it. And I'm sure it was only 30 seconds or so that I was alone in the dark uh, on the street corner before the bus stopped and let my dad off. But it was certainly was not the best introduction to public transit. Now, going back to Transloc in 2006, to, to that time, my job that summer, and also when I returned after finishing my MBA, was to sell Transloc's passenger information system, mostly to colleges and universities like NC State and Duke and Harvard and Yale and the University of Florida. So if, if any of you have been um, to a university or you've used Transloc before, uh, maybe just either put up your hand and wave or, or put it in chat. I'd love to hear like who's actually used Transloc at some point at NC State, uh, Duke, some other places around here. I'd love to hear about that um, as well uh, in the chat. So those of you who, who have, um, and I see a couple com coming in there in the chat. Um, you know that Transloc showed your buses moving in real time on your phone or computer, so you never had to worry about missing a bus. And, and since I began that journey at Transloc in 2006, the world has changed quite a bit around us. So when I started, the iPhone didn't exist. In 2006, when I started interning at Transloc, the iPhone did not exist. It's kind of wild to think about. Uber and Lyft were years from being founded. And the day I returned from um, getting my MBA to Transloc, the junior senator from Illinois and presidential long shot Barack Obama won the Iowa caucus. So a lot has happened uh, over the past 14 years that I've been at Transloc. So during those years at Transloc, I've reflected a lot, not only on my parents helping of others, but the why behind it, because we are all interdependent on each other. And I've noticed over the last few years, there's been an increasing failure to acknowledge that interdependence. It's, it's why we have a federal tax policy that favors the ultra wealthy. It's why we're relying on GoFundMes to pay for healthcare. It's why we have injustices like Breonna Taylor who was murdered sleeping in her own bed and Ahmaud Aubrey who was murdered running down the street. It's why we have a world literally on fire and it's why we have public transit, which is perilously close to a death spiral of funding cuts leading to decreasing service, leading to less ridership, leading to funding cuts, lather, rinse, and repeat. So this month's Creative Mornings theme is transit. And so I wanna to talk to you about public transit. So I know we asked earlier, there's several folks who have had some exposure to public transit, but for those of you who haven't had that much exposure, it is the embodiment of helping others. It's helping people have the mobility necessary to access jobs, education, social activities. It's helping our community reduce congestion and pollution. It's helping use our public space more effectively, efficiently, and equitably. I actually think that the state of public transit today is actually a perfect extension of what I learned from my parents all those years ago. Helping others, especially those who need it the most, because we are all in this together. So I would like to share three ways that public transit is helpful and can be even more impactful when we truly lean into this interdependence. So I wanna first start with a fundamental tension that public transit everywhere has to reckon with, which is who is it serving? So I wanna take a, a poll here. I know some of you have said, uh, if uh, some the transit you have ridden. I, I'm curious who has ridden a public transit bus at any point in the last year? And I recognize obviously with the pandemic that is that is that is changing. So give yourself like 18 months or so. I don't know. All right. So I'm, I'm seeing a good number of hands being raised there. Um, so a, a good uh, a good number there. All right, good. Um, and so the reason I'm I'm asking that, and the reason I'm asking this question about who are we serving, are that different audiences require different things. And there's a wide range of backgrounds and incomes that use public transit uh, in DC and New York especially. In the triangle though, that isn't really the case. In, in the triangle, 65% of riders have household incomes less than $25,000, household incomes. 57% of riders do not have a vehicle in their household and three quarters are people of color. So right now, in part due to the half cent transit taxes that Orange, Durham, and Wake counties passed, we are currently evaluating whether to implement a commuter rail system between Durham and Raleigh. So my question to you is, who will that serve? 
my guess is it's going to serve many of the people who are in this room, relatively wealthy, car owners probably, and probably white. And while getting cars off of I-40 in the Durham freeway sure would be nice and, and would be positive environmentally, I'm, I want to ask a question, what will commuter rail give us that the humble Go Triangle DRX Express bus cannot, especially if we could give it its own lane on I-40? I'll tell you what it would give us. It would give us something that feels different, but really isn't that different. It's easy to fall into this elite projection trap that transit consultant Jarrett Walker, who actually worked on the Wake County Transit Plan, warns about. Uh, elite projection is when you think that your elite point of view is what the rest of the community needs. But that often isn't the case. So using this lens of asking how can we be the most helpful because we're all in this together, we should instead invest further in the transit network that we already have, increasing frequency, connectivity, and dedicated lanes to make it work more effectively, not only for those who need it most, but also for the whole community. Unlike commuter rail, there wouldn't be a ribbon cutting, but not only would it help existing and future public transit riders to have more access to jobs, education, and community, it would also help address some of the economic and social divisions in our communities where the diversity of those who ride transit does not reflect the diversity of our community. So Columbus, Ohio is an interesting example. The downtown improvement district provided free bus passes for 25,000 downtown workers a few years ago. So prior to the pass, only 5% of downtown workers commuted by public transit. So after the free bus passes, everybody that worked in downtown Columbus, 25,000 people, uh, after they gave them free bus passes, and, and certainly before the pandemic, that number had doubled to 10%. So that was good for congestion and parking, but, but here's what I thought was really interesting about it. The program helped diversify who rode the bus, generating empathy for the important role that public transit serves, but also by putting white collar and blue collar and pink collar and service workers in the same physical space, reinforcing that we are all in this together, which is a critical, critical thing that public transit does. Second, and related to who public transit serves, is where it goes. So what I'm gonna put up here on the screen right now are two areas that are served by Go Raleigh, public transit here in Raleigh. And interestingly, they have about the same amount of population, right? So you've got downtown, which doesn't have as much population, but you've got all the neighborhoods uh, surrounding it. And then you have North Raleigh off of Creedmoor Road. And so they actually have about the same amount of, of population, but one is much easier to serve, and that's downtown. The reason it can traverse around downtown Raleigh so much more easily is because it's dense and grid-like, and the bus doesn't have to divert much to get to all of the uh, major attractions. So in North Raleigh off of Creedmoor Road, the bus never really diverts from Creedmoor Road because the neighborhoods surrounding Creedmoor are not that dense and the roads are curvy and in cul-de-sacs making it hard to serve effectively. So by its very nature, public transit works by connecting dense areas of places people live, work, and play. That's why you see the tons of bus stops downtown and near NC State and at the hospitals and major cultural attractions and not as many up on Creedmoor Road in North Raleigh that have more separate land uses with housing in one area and retail in the other. So there's a problem with that though. Over the past couple decades, as Wake County has grown significantly to now North Carolina's most populous county, the shape of Raleigh has changed significantly. So I arrived actually in the Triangle in 1995 to go to Carolina. And Raleigh had about half of its current population. It was actually smaller than Durham at the time, Durham today. Um, is, is bigger than Raleigh was uh, 25 years ago, which I guess shouldn't be surprising, but it's still kind of surprising to me as a Durham resident. Um, so Raleigh had about half of its current population and two thirds of its current square mileage. So there's been more geographic growth and there's been more population growth, but there's been significant shifting around due to the low income concentration and low income displacement, according to analysis done by Brian Carrillo at Wake Up Wake County. And so what you can see here is how there's there's the, um, the blue there are the, are the areas where there's been that displacement. So, the, the, so what does that mean? The people that may need transit the most 
are now living in areas that are harder to serve, right? Remember I showed you that Creedmoor Road and that North Raleigh with public transit because those areas are less conducive to public transit. So the choices that we make as a community about growth and about jobs and about economic incentives have an impact on where people live, who can afford it and how they can access those opportunities. So these decisions aren't made in a vacuum, right? The affordable dwelling units conversation that Raleigh's had over the course of the last couple of years. Increased density in projects near downtown that are easier to serve with transit, which again has been a, a topic of conversation in Raleigh. Um, or the affordable housing bond that is on the ballot this year. These choices that you make beyond transit impact how helpful public transit can be and whether it can serve the whole community effectively. And so the final connection point between public transit and helping is how we pay for it. And so public transit, by the nature of its title, public, is funded by you and me and everyone else who buys a cup of coffee or a pair of jeans in our area. So in some areas, like here locally, there are special taxes that we pay uh, that pay a portion of that public transit, as well as the city's or the community's general funds. And as well, the government, the federal government, pays uh, a portion via grants to the states. Um, usually that's for capital projects. So, so that light or uh, the light rail project in, in Durham was going to be partially funded by, by that capital money. Uh, the commuter rail, if we do it, is going to be partially funded by that capital money from the federal government or to buy new buses. Um, and then state and local governments kind of provide operational systems. And so with the exception of some systems like Chapel Hill Transit or the Wolf Line, there's also the money you pay at the fare box. So I want to I ask another question in the chat here. And Michelle, I'm going to put you on the spot here first uh, while everybody else thinks about it. So what percent of public transit is paid for by the rider? And John Talmadge, who's on here, and Sean Egan, you're not allowed to answer this question because I know you know. Um, so Vishali, what do you think, what do you think the um, percent of public transit is paid for by the rider? Um, I'm leaning towards 10%, okay. but I'm not sure. It seems, yeah, I'm in the same place as you, Janine. Um, okay. I, it seems hard for me to believe that all the beautiful buses we have and the amazing drivers and everything can be paid for by what I pay for a ride, which is really not that much. Right, right. So, uh, so yeah, you're pretty, you're pretty close here. So, uh, so nationally, what you can see here is that fares make up about 26% of the actual uh, cost of running public transit. Um, and here locally, it's actually a lot less because um, we've got some, some systems that, that charge a lot less. Go Durham charges less than, than the other, um, other transit agencies here locally. So the vast majority of funding for public transit, even if you never ride it, is by people who don't ride it, right? So, so even if you never use public transit, it's helpful to you by reducing the, the traffic around you, reducing carbon emissions, allowing more people to access jobs, education, and community. And just like the fire department, which we all pay for, even though we hope we never need it, public transit is a public good. And just like if we funded the fire department incompletely and paid for firefighters, but not fire hoses, public transit wouldn't work as well if we don't fund it well. And so a transit system that only comes once an hour or doesn't connect with another, other lines actually gets in the way of people getting to jobs in a reasonable amount of time. So in Raleigh, transit access to jobs is, is increasing, but slowly, at least compared to the top 50 US census areas. And obviously job access and obviously employment is a critical determinant for fundamental well-being of people in our community, like financial security, and education and home ownership and, and their own emotional and psychological health. So similar to what my parents taught me growing up, public transit is built on helpfulness and reinforces our interdependence. And it can't work if it prioritizes the wrong audience and doesn't focus on those who need it the most. And it can't work unless we plan and orient the geographic areas of our communities to make it work effectively. And it can't work unless we all pitch in to help fund it. And this need to help others because of our interdependence doesn't end at public transit or, or fighter fighting or, or even teaching kids. It's all around us. And so for this world to work and to create the communities we're all proud to be a part of, we have to lean into this helpfulness and interdependence. 
So how do we get there? I think to get there requires looking at things differently than we might normally. So I wanna leave you with three ways that you all as community leaders and community members can do that. Lessons that I pulled from my work as a co-host of the Movement Podcast. And so I'll, I'll start with, for a long time, I thought leadership was taking action. Big, big, bold action. And as I've talked with leaders on the podcast, I've seen that I actually need to look at this precisely upside down. So instead of taking decisive action, what we need first is reflection. So what do I mean by reflection? It means taking the time to truly understand what your community values. What is its vision? And what is the timeline of that vision? Without the grounding in these core areas, decisive action is wasted. So let me give you a tactical example on how to apply this. A few months ago, I had a guest on the podcast, Lynn Ross, and she framed this up, I, I feel like, pretty well. So Lynn manages a project called Reimagining the Civic Commons in 10 communities around the country. And they are, re are reimagining public spaces to be intentionally welcoming, diverse, and sustainable. And so how do they know how fast to reimagine those communities? Lynn says we only can move at the speed of trust. If folks are saying this feels too fast, or we've heard this before, eh, that means you're going too fast. And so this is another quote from Lynn. We move at the speed of trust with our residents because we trust them and we want them to trust us in doing this work because ultimately these spaces are theirs. I think that flows in nicely to the second lesson I've learned from leaders I've talked to. I used to think that leadership was the mayor standing at the dais or the muckety mucks cutting a ribbon at, at, at an opening. And what I've learned is that leadership is actually the opposite. It's listening to the people closest to the problems that they face every day. So being closer to the problems means you are closer to the potential solutions and should thus be empowered to solve them. And this requires egoless and servant leadership and true community engagement. A great example of this is the 90th Avenue repaving in Oakland to reduce car speeding and increase in pedestrian and bike safety that my guest Brittany Brown worked on at the Oakland Department of Transportation. As part of this process, the city added a bike lane to 90th Avenue, but for those of you who bike in our communities, the bike lane had a twist. It was a bike lane running down the center of the street and dec decorated with bold and vibrant art. Why? Because in East Oakland, a key part of the community culture are scraper bikes. And you can see an example on the screen there. Young and not so young cyclists decorate their bikes with color, it could be paint, it could be candy wrappers and everything in between. And the city worked directly with the scraper bike team on putting this project together and engaging other community stakeholders. If they hadn't done this, the city would have risked creating something that might have worked for the bureaucrats, but not for the community. So finally, the, the perception that, that the leader has all the answers is just plain false. The best leaders are actually taking the opposite approach. They are humble. They are willing to ask questions, acknowledge deficiencies of knowledge, and develop a clear point of view on areas of importance to the community. Doing this effectively is necessary to build a community that helps others and acknowledges the interconnected web of how we all live and how we can solve complex problems. So Mark Donaghy is the CEO of the Greater Dayton Regional Transit Authority in Ohio. And he'll never be on the TV show Undercover Boss because he spends so much time talking to his employees and riders that they all know who he is. He supplements this experience by actually driving the bus himself occasionally to hear directly from riders or working in the mechanic shop to hear from his team members. In fact, when I met with him, he was almost late to the airport because he was talking to a rider uh, for so long, helping her. So this obviously isn't the type of leadership where you will keep your suits clean but it's the type of leadership that will help you learn your organization and your community better. If we can do these things, if we can look at the traditional way of leadership upside down, we truly have the potential to bring about change, help others and make the most of this interconnected world that we all share. Now, before I go, I wanna share one more lesson that I've learned along the way. Um, I'm curious, again, uh, throw this in chat or just throw your hands up. Uh, who has seen the musical Hamilton either in person or on Disney Plus? Lots of hands. All right, I saw, saw some hands go up there. 
I know, Vishal, I know that's, that's one thing that you and I share, right? Yeah. So um, I've probably watched it a half dozen times in all on Disney Plus and, and a, a, in person once, but my, my wife and daughter have something more akin to an addiction. So my wife has seen it in person four times. Uh, my daughter has watched the Disney Plus version at least 20 times. Um, and an aspect of the Hamilton story that its uh, creator, Lin-Manuel Miranda, draws that, that really resonates in many of the conversations I have with leaders everywhere is the importance of advocacy in order to help those who need it the most. So what is advocacy? My loose definition is the application of leadership by those not explicitly in charge, especially by those who are either disenfranchised in some way or are the users of a product or system. And so as some of you know, before he was a famous, as a founding father, Hamilton was an orphan. He was penniless, he was, he was overlooked. So as Lin-Manuel noted in his original lyrics for the show, the plan is to fan this spark into a flame. And as many of you know, all fires need three ingredients. They need a spark, they need oxygen, and they need fuel. Similarly, in order to help more people in this community that we live in, we need to invest in reflection, exercise servant leadership, and serve with humility. And then, and then, and only then, after all of that, as the major theme of Hamilton illustrates, we have to act. If we actually want to turn this spark into a flame, we're going to have to light a match. So if you haven't already done so, you can light your own tiny but important advocacy match by voting either early today or tomorrow uh, early or on election day on Tuesday. And if I may be so bold, I recommend you vote for those who not only want to help those who need it the most, but do so with an acknowledgement that we are all in this together. And that's what will get us where we need to go. Thank you. So you offered a couple of different ideas throughout and ways that we could help. Um, someone asked in the chat if we should make public transit free for all, like that that is a solution that you would suggest based on how. Yeah, yeah. so that's a, that's, a great, that's a great question. It's one I've actually wrestled with a lot and, and a lot of people are, um, a lot of people in the industry are wrestling with that too. So um, the, the, the key question with, with, with that is um, free transit, even if it's free, that isn't helpful you know, if it doesn't come frequently, if it doesn't connect to places that people need to go, um, it doesn't matter if it's free, if it's crappy, right? Point conceded. That said, I think there's power to, to the free. I think there's power to never having to worry about whether you have correct change. Uh, there's power to uh, it being open to everyone uh, and so forth. So I, I, I'd say I am, I am more to the side of free than to uh, then, but uh, but recognize that that crappy is not better than free. Actually, Abigail asked if there was like any behavioral economics that goes into like charging a price versus like being free. Is that accurate? Uh, that's a it's a good question. I'm probably a little bit out of my depth there to uh, to to really speak uh, too much. I mean, certainly there is some. Um, commitment and consistency from a psychological perspective by, by paying, uh, it makes you more kind of committed uh, and, and thus um, kind of maybe intellectually more kind of involved. Uh, but I'm, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure that's, what, that's what's missing. I mean, I think what I hope I, I articulated here uh, today is that, is that for public transit to work effectively, we all need to to be a part of it, right? And so that doesn't necessarily mean we all need to ride it every day or we all need to ride it even every month, but that we all need to acknowledge the importance of it and invest in it as if, as if we did. And if I think we can do that. Um, and also I, I hope I articulated that, that uh, we sometimes need to do things that may not be in our own best interest, but are in the best interest of our community. And uh, you know, I've been, I've been a big commuter rail fan for a long, long time, but as I've reflected on it for a long, long time, uh, I've come to the conclusion that I think it would, it would benefit me as a relatively privileged person. Um, and I'm not sure how much it would benefit those who actually might need transit the most. And I think that's where we need to be thinking about yeah. putting our, our money. 
we have a question that says, as the triangle grows, what are some ways we can reduce vehicle congestion and encourage public transportation, especially for people commuting to work every day? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I feel like we've, we've, we've spent the last uh, 20 years, probably longer, doing what's called transportation demand management, which is marketing to people to try to say, hey, take transit, take a van pool, you know, here's how much you can save, so forth. I, I frankly, I mean, I think that the, those tools are, are fine, but they're not nearly enough, right? They're necessary, but not sufficient. What we need more than anything else is government making decisions, leaders making decisions to say, this is what we need to invest in, right? So for instance, let me give you an example. You know, and I'm sure there's some legal statutory things that, that Sean Egan or John Thomas who are on the, on the call can probably pipe in and, and tell me about, but um, having a bus lane on the Durham freeway would do more to get people riding the bus than anything else, right? Because if you are sitting in your single occupancy vehicle and you see a bus hurtling by at 50 miles an hour, that will go a long way towards incentivizing you to change your approach. So uh, I am, um, I think it's great that we, we market to people, but, but we're only getting the, the, the true believers like me who, 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 and some of you, I'm sure. Uh, but if we really want to change habits and, and make a difference at scale, we have to have government uh, regulation, maybe is not the right word, but, but you know, okay. government tools to, to make that a reality. There are a couple of follow up questions, but I think one of the challenges, um, I think you've spoken about this in, in other places, and I'm curious what you say, but you, would, you were, I think you've written about how half measures actually do more damage than good. Is, would you say like that transportation demand management falls into that category? It's not helping move us far enough. And so it, it kind of puts us in a place of complacency. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think I've, I've, I've used that half measure argument before, certainly as it relates to bike lanes. You know, so if, if, you, if you have a, a, a bike lane uh, painted on the street um, that doesn't have any physical protection that keeps you safe from cars, I would actually argue that might be, might be worse than, than it, nothing at all, right? Uh, because it gives you this false sense of security that, that there is actually something that uh, is protecting you, but there really isn't. Um, so as it relates to public transit, yeah, I mean, I think if, if we're, if we're funding transit that has, um, a bus that comes once an hour, no one is ever going to take it unless you absolutely have to. So I, I do believe that like, if we want to do this well, you have to really do it. And, and we are right. I mean, Durham, um, and Raleigh with the transit tax have made huge investments in, in, uh, the, the baseline transit, you know, service that thousands and thousands of riders on depend on every day. My argument is it's not enough, right? We need a lot more than that. And if you really want to, there's a great, there's a great video that Vox uh, made last week about public transit in the U.S. And, um, you know, it, it says like in, in, in Toronto, I think there are, you know, their network of routes that come every 15 minutes all day from like 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night. Like it blankets the city. So if you knew that you could walk out your door, I mean, even to the suburbs, like yeah. what looks like North Raleigh. Um, and if you could walk out your door and know that you could have a bus coming in 15 minutes from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., it wouldn't happen today, right? It would, people aren't going to change their habits overnight. But over time, that would have a huge, huge impact. Um, and, you know, I'm a firm believer of, of supply begets demand. Right, so we have to put the supply of that transit out in order to get that demand. Right, not the other way around. Uh, same thing with bike lanes. You, you have to you have to like have actual you know protective bike lanes, and then once people see it, then they can start to to, to use it on a regular basis. Sort of like what what can we do to help support public transit, um, even if we're not actively utilizing it? Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a great question as well. So. Um, so one, I think, is, is certainly vote for those, those measures so that, that um, are investing in public transit. Um, vote for those leaders who are thinking about this in that way, um, that recognize that, uh, that public transit is 
uh, is helpful and it, it kind of reinforces that interdependence that we talked about. Um, there are certainly organizations that are involved in advocacy. Uh, so Wake Up Wake County certainly does some advocacy around uh, transit. Uh, Bike Durham uh, in, in Durham is also, uh, has started a transit equity campaign uh, recently that you can get involved with. So there's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Um, and, uh, but I, I think primarily, I think we're, we're gonna need, we're gonna need public leaders to, to invest in what we need in order to, to build this, this world we wanna live in, right? And, and right. Until, we, until we do that, I mean, so that, that's, why, that's why voting makes a huge difference. Judd is asking what tactics communities have used um, to get their mun municipal leaders to experience um, the existing transit networks and kind of immerse themselves in the in what the realities are. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'm actually working on a blog post right now about um, elected officials who use public transit on a regular basis. Um, and it's actually a surprisingly small list. And somebody in chat mentioned a few minutes ago about empathy, and I totally agree. I think empathy is, is one of these things that um, if you don't understand that, uh, what that experience is like uh, to wait for transit that comes once an hour, it's gonna be, it's gonna be really hard to create good policy, right? So, um, I mean, it, 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 it's, 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 that's, that's the fundamental question. I mean, I think we, we, have to, we have to get folks to understand the experience of doing that. And I mean, again, no one, no one has to like give up their car tomorrow in order to do that. Um, I think if, if folks kind of just looked at this from, from an experiential standpoint, because I thought about this all the time, right? When I ride uh, back before the pandemic, when I used to ride the bus uh, from my house, so I'd ride my bike to, to downtown Durham, about two miles, and then take uh, the, the 700 bus to our office, which is located right across from the Go Triangle um, hub there in RTP. Um, it would take me longer than if I drove my car. It would. So a lot of times people just stop there. They say, oh, well, the public transit takes longer, so I'm not gonna do it. Well, but what did public transit give me? It gave me a chance to exercise. Uh, gave me a chance to see people. I often would see people on the bus or when I was biking. I uh, gave me a chance to read on the bus. Um, so, you know, if you're just looking at time as the only uh, metric that you're using to determine whether something is valuable or not, it's, it's you know, public transit is going to lose often, right? Even in, even in New York City sometimes, right? But if you, if you start to, like, look at some of those other things that, that make it valuable, I think that's, that's, that's the key. 